Dr. Hill has been a minister of the gospel, a teacher, and a university professor. Dr. Hill has been a teacher, a principal, and a university professor. Together, their lives have recently taken a very different turn. He is Dr. Roland Hill, she is Dr. Susie Hill, and this is our conversation. Dr. Hill, Dr. Hill, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Oh, we're it. excited about being here, sir. You have lived more full lives <laughs> and accomplished more than many people would ever hope to or dream to. Yet recently, things have ramped up. You're now the directors of United Prison Ministries International. And uh, I would like you to tell me as much as you possibly can about what you're doing right now. What's UPMI? United Prison Ministries International is a nonprofit organization committed to working with prisoners behind bars and ex-offenders when they get out. We've been doing this for over 40 years, and we've been blessed to be uh, working with prisoners in about 4,000 prisons in the United States, and we send materials to 72 countries in the world. So it's exciting. Prison ministry is powerful. There'll be people watching right now who know firsthand, but at the same time, others who know precious little or maybe nothing at all about prison ministry. Let's talk about that in a moment. First, let's talk about you. Take me back to the beginning, wherever the beginning was for, let's start with you, Dr. Hill. Well, first of all, thank you for having us. We're so glad to be here today to share our passion for United Prison Ministries and the work that we're doing. I was born in Honduras. I'm a native of San Pedro Sula, and I grew up there for the first eight years of my life. So Spanish is my native language. I speak fluent Spanish. When we came to this country, I actually had an experience where our teachers told our parents, we should forget Spanish and learn English. And they listened to the teachers, but God mm -hmm. gave me Spanish as my gift. So I am so glad that I'm able to speak, preach, teach, and even have a book written in Spanish. Oh, uh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> but we met, my husband and I met uh, at Oakwood College. We were married in 1975. We were celebrating 47 years of marriage. So he pastored and we were, I worked with him in ministry. I always saw us as one in ministry. We got married, we had two children. I stayed home with our children until they entered first grade and then continued to just work alongside my husband in ministry until he retired. And now we are living in Huntsville, Alabama. We thought we were gonna be retired. We thought so. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah God had uh, different plans, didn't he? Yeah, but I did, I, get a, I got a chance to teach. Uh, I became a Spanish teacher. That's when I really learned the constructs of my language. And then I also taught at the university and was able to help students learn about families and how you know, the family works. And, and it was just exciting to be able to help them shape and de make decisions for their lives when it comes to their future in relationship to marriage, in relationship to parenting. And it was just exciting for me. I loved it. And you picked up a PhD along the way. Tell me a little about that. Well, I went to, I actually never really had that as one of my goals in life. My husband was the one who was telling me. That's correct. <laughs> that I should get a terminal degree. And I said, that's your dream. That's not my dream. And uh, I did wake up one morning early and I told my husband, I think I want to get my PhD. He said, you do? And he went upstairs in the office, came down in 30 minutes with a printout. And the printout <laughs> said, this is what you're going to get your PhD in. And this is where you're going to get it. And I looked at it it intrigued me. I said, honey, I like this. I love the family. Get a degree in family studies. That's just where I'm at. So that was Sunday morning. On Tuesday, we went to Texas Women's University. And on Friday of that same week, I was enrolled in the PhD program and Fantastic. I finished it. And what perfect preparation for what you're doing now. Dr. Roland Hill, take me back a little ways to, uh, to, to where you sprang from, and, and uh, I'm very interested in learning about your, your call to and your entrance into pastoral ministry. I'm a preacher's kid, all right? My father spent 48 years in the pastorate, and he was one of those good, solid pastors who lived a Christian life before us. And when I, I was six years old, 
he was preaching, made an appeal. I walked down the aisle, gave my heart to Christ, and accepted my call to the ministry. So from a child? From six years old. You knew? I knew. I've never veered from that at all. When I was coming through elementary school, middle school, high school, college, I knew I was called to be a pastor, and that's all I've ever wanted to do. Now, there have been some roads that have taken me through specialized ministry and pastor and ministry, but I'm a pastor at heart. That's what I was called to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I went off to Oakwood, finished up the degree there at Oakwood University now, and then I went on and did an MDiv at Andrews University. And then I followed God's calling to finish a D-Men with a concentration in something that I wrote called Theoeconomics, the economy of God. As a pastor, I saw that many of my members were struggling with financial issues, and especially from a theological standpoint. And so I committed myself to learn all I could from the Word of God about how to help empower my people economically. Mm. And I ended up writing uh, several books on that area because I'm committed to empowering people. I believe, John, that theological enlightenment brings economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. And I saw it as I crafted out this new economic philosophy called theoeconomics or theoeconomism. Fantastic. Well, somewhere along the line, there was a a transition to prison ministry. Now, is is this something that had been percolating away in the background for years? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Tell uh, me how it came about. When I was teaching at Southwestern Adventist University, there was a gentleman that would come around my office and said, Dr. Hill, please help me out at the prison. And I found all excuses not to go. And one day I was in my devotion and I said, God, I want to reach black men. And God says they're in prison. Within a matter of an hour or so, this guy calls me and he says, Dr. Hill, I was impressed to call you. Can you please come and help us out at the prison and teach theoeconomics? Of course, I couldn't refuse him. God has spoken. So I went and taught at the prison theoeconomics for six weeks, and the guys just loved it. They saw an economic philosophy that would help them to go on the right path when they got out of prison. But my problem, John, is then when I finished the six weeks, the burden left. And I got busy traveling the world. My wife and I do presentations on family and finance. And so we've done a lot of them around the world. And so I got busy doing that while I was teaching full time. And it was not until I was retired and at the church that we attend, they were having prison ministry day. And I told Susie, I'm not going. And because she is a woman of God, She says, we're going. Honey, we need to go. We (laughs) need to go to church. (laughs) So you tell me why you were dead set against going. You knew that this is going to get you involved in something, didn't you? Well, there were a couple of things. The the first thing is that when you talk about prison ministry, who gets excited about it? And then secondly, you know, that's not something that I saw myself doing, especially in retirement. But when I got to church and the guy started preaching, the spirit of the living God started moving in my heart. Tears start coming down. And then God says, now, I'm bringing back what I gave you 25 years earlier. Mm. You must do it. And after the guy got through preaching, I'd already made my commitment, but it was sealed because the brother that he brought up to testify, this is what clinched it for me. I was his resident assistant, his RA at Oakwood his freshman year. I hadn't seen him in 40 years. And he tells this story that he had been in prison for 20 years, and it just blew my mind. This is a good guy. And so we talked after service, and God says, now it's time for you to go to work in the prison ministry. So I started looking around, seeing how I could do it myself personally, and then I ran into UPMI International. And the Lord said, you need to call. I call, and Natalie, of course, you know Natalie, you've talked to her on the phone. Yes. She runs the organization. She's our COO of the organization. And they've been looking for leadership for about 10 years. And she told me after the organization asked my wife and I to lead it, when you call Roland, 
I knew it was God's answer to our prayer. I just didn't want to tell you on the first phone call. So that's how we got involved. So, so what was it like entering into this uh, ministry leadership, uh, a ministry with a rich history, a broad reach, and profoundly important? I imagine this was like diving in the deep, deep, deep end. <laughs> but do you know how Real God deep. works? God, God Go works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Yes. We knew the leadership that we're following. We know Natalie, she, we went to the same church. When I was a girl, they sat on the left side of the church. I would go and sit on the right side. I saw her when she was a girl, her mom and her, and her other siblings. And we knew the uh, founding fathers uh, originally before they even thought about prison ministries themselves. So we have a deep history. She remembers me and I remember, we're like family. Mm -hmm. So that made it easier for us when we came together to talk about working at United Prison Ministries, and they have done an exceptional, exceptional job. job. The foundation is so solid. Mm -hmm. They built a solid foundation. Started in 1981 with United Prison Ministries International and have continued to work giving materials and printing materials for prisoners. Now, what excited us, John, and me particularly, when I looked at what I was called to do it fit into everything that I've been trained to do, writing, preaching, evangelism, and being a pastor behind bars, because ultimately that's what I am. I'm a pastor. So I said, now this gives me an opportunity to share, part of the pun, with a captive audience. Captive audience. That's right. And let me tell you, John, I've been going into the prisons recently, and I just have been enthralled and excited to watch these men hear the word of God and moved by the spirit of God to change lives. Tell me a little about some of the specifics that UPMI gets involved in, 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 in prison ministry, in ministering to, to inmates. Well, we're actually, there are four things that we are actually committed to do at, at United Prison Ministries International. The first thing is we're committed to distributing Christian materials in the area of self-reliance, self-development, and spirituality. So we've been doing that well over the last 40 years. We've distributed over 78 million, I said million pieces of literature. That's a lot. In prisons in America and all over the world, okay? Then the second thing we do is we develop materials for prisoners. Because when we go inside, one of the things that we've discovered is you can bring them to Christ, but you have to take them beyond that and so we're developing materials that's particularly designed to stop recidivism because there's a, what do you call a revolving door sure. that keep coming back each time. And we've we're committed to developing materials to help them when they get back out and the word is back in the free world that they can stay. Mm -hmm. Then the third thing we do is we partner with organizations that allow the guys when they get out to find stabilization like people who provide transitional home, transitional housing. Uh, some of them have addictions. So we work with organizations to help that. And then the fourth thing we do is we train churches on how to do prison ministry. Because oftentimes people go into prisons and they have a preconceived idea what the prisoner is. Like I was talking to someone yesterday and they were saying, well, Dr. Hill, you know, the prisoners don't do, they're not that smart. I said, you haven't been in the prison because some of the smartest men in the world are behind bars. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for mentoring to take their gifts and talents and turn them into something positive. What I find fascinating about this is this is, this is not any kind of a, a, a Band-Aid no. solution. This is a very comprehensive approach addressing a, a, an entire person that individual's needs, not just while they're inside, but you're looking forward to transitioning people successfully from behind bars to life, as you said, uh, in the free world. Well, see, we, we speak on behalf of the 2.2 million men and women behind bars and the 5.2 million that are ex-offenders. And so we get very passionate because who becomes their voice? Who really tells the world what it's like to be behind the bars? So we go in, spend time with them. We 
again, prepare materials that help to transition them because many of them are going to get out. In fact, statistics tells us that there are over 600,000 prisoners released every single year. And the interesting thing, John, between three to five years, 77% of them return back to jail. That's, a, that's just a huge that's number. That's staggering. Isn't yeah, it? it tells us there's something really broken in, yes. in society and maybe even in that system. Yeah, it's really hard because just last year, just to give you a personal story, just last year, an individual whom we actually ministered to behind bars, received materials from UPMI, was released after being in prison for 20 years. Well, and then they dropped him off at a corner somewhere, and he had to figure out what to do after that. All he had was money in his pocket to maybe catch a bus somewhere, and it wasn't enough to do anything. And now we as a ministry have garnered our resources around him and helped him get back into society, functioning, finding him a job. We have an individual who has actually provided him work every day that he can use and start earning money. We also helped him get his, because uh, he's a veteran, so he's able to get housing through the Veterans Administration. But without your help, none of that would have happened. None of that no. would have happened. And, and you got to ask he, yourself. He was actually you. sleeping on the streets. Bro. you got to ask yourself about a system. You incarcerate somebody for 20 odd years and drop them off on a street corner. You might as well not even let him out. It's just an invitation to come back in a He's week. He's going to go back. In fact, they told, no question. they told him, oh, you'll be back. The, the guys at the, 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 the were keeping, would say, you'll be back. Every time he passed him, oh, you'll be back. That's what he said to him. And he says, oh, no. And we were just blessed to be able to be there for him and continuing to provide the support that he needs. Yes, thank God. He will not be back. No. Because God stepped in through United Prison Ministries International. And God is doing that again and again and again. Uh, we'll hear more about this in just a moment uh, with Dr. Roland Hill and Dr. Susie Hill. I'm John Bradshaw. This is Our Conversation. There are some things you don't want to forget. And there are some things God specifically tells us to remember. At the dawn of time, the creator of the universe gifted to the human family a divine prescription for combating stress, busyness, and the pressures of daily life a regular blessing of time spent in the heart of God. Don't miss a day to remember. We'll travel to the largest Ten Commandments in the world and rediscover heaven's purpose for your life. A day to remember. A personal God seeking a meaningful connection with His children. A way forward for spiritual renewal. We'll open the Bible together and learn that God has blessings for His children that are being overlooked and neglected. Get more from God. Go deeper in your faith. A day to remember. Watch now on It Is Written TV. Thursday, August the 5th, 2010 was not a happy day for 33 men. When a collapse in a mine in Chile buried them 2,300 feet below ground. No matter how much they tried to escape, there was no way out. Rescue would have to come from above. On the outskirts of the San Jose mine, over two and a half thousand people gathered. And with each failed rescue attempt, despair increased. And families gathered together to pray for a miracle. From the Atacama Desert comes a story of tragedy, a story of uncertainty, yet a story of courage hope, and ultimately, a story of salvation. Wait on the Lord and the miracle will come. Camp Hope. Watch now on It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Conversations. My guests are Dr. Susie Hill and Dr. Roland Hill. They are the directors of United Prison Ministries International, an organization with a rich history of ministering to people behind bars. And not only that, enabling people to transition to a successful life in the free world and very frequently a life lived in the heart of Jesus. Doctors Hill, let's talk about some of the, the many uh, prison ministry success stories. Now, I was fortunate to pastor a, a congregation and 
uh, this congregation provided really the backbone for a, a thriving uh, prison ministries uh, ministry, really, organization. The, the miracles we saw, the miracles we saw. Now, people can tend to be a little cynical right. uh, about prisoners, and people can be a little dismissive about prisoners. Why we would, I don't know, because this country has a gigantic prison population. There are few families that have not been impacted by the prison system in some way. We would surely want to see redemption for all. And it sounds to me that that's really in the DNA of United Prison Ministries International. Redemption uh, for a major population that has, um, has the odds stacked against it. Let's talk about some of the, the, the miracles, some of the success stories, some of the incredible things you've seen through prison ministry. You know, I mentioned to you, John, about this guy that uh, kind of sealed my involvement in prison ministry. Well, I actually began to mentor him and encouraged and inspired him to start his own nonprofit organization because he's very interested in providing transitional housing. You know, he's one of the guys after 20 years in prison, they give him a bag of cookies and send him on his way, and he didn't have a place to stay. Yeah, these guys are set up to fail. So set very up often. to fail. Set up to fail. So he comes out and he goes to one transitional house, house that eventually closes down. So he said, I'm going to start my own. I walked him through, helped him get his nonprofit organization. So now he's a tax exempt nonprofit organization and he has four bin in his transitional house right now. Thank God. And he's such a positive man. And remember now he spent 20 years behind bars, Yeah. but he's so positive. And one of the reasons why is he has purpose in life. And that's what we do with United Prison Ministries International. We're concerned with helping men find purpose in life. One of the programs that we're launching this year is called PREP, Prison Economic Reform Educational Program. It's a three course curriculum designed to help men while they're in prison change their philosophy and their theology so that they become self-reliant. One of the courses teaches them what biblical success is all about. Another course teaches them how to steward their life because most of them are there because they've never learned how to manage their life. And then the last course teaches them financial literacy and it teaches them how to run and operate their own businesses. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yes. it's because that's the thing that's really hard. When they come out, the, like you said, the odds are stacked against oh, yeah. them. They can't get jobs. They're felons. They can't even rent an apartment. Right. And who's going to hire them? When they find out that they are ex-felons, they usually lose their jobs. So it's nice to know that while they're behind bars, we're giving them an opportunity to think in terms of being the job, of owning and operating their own business, mm. using their skills, whatever skill. Everybody has been given a gift That's by correct. God. So we help the prisoners learn and identify their gift, find a need in society, and fill that need inside of their gift. That's we, a job nobody can take from you. Right. We call them Godpreneurs. Because we believe the call to Christ is not simply to the kingdom of God, but as a worker to produce in the kingdom of God. And there's a difference between an entrepreneur and a Godpreneur. These men and women that we train through our P-Rep project, Prison Economic Reform Educational Program, they are committed Christians who are committed to use their God-given talents in a business that will produce for the kingdom of God. Now tell me how you go about not so much constructing a program like that, but getting that, facilitating that inside prisons. Is, that does not sound like a simple thing, but I mean, United Prison Ministries International has f well, 40 years experience. Well, that's, that's the great thing about United Prison Ministries International. The founders laid a great found, uh, foundation. We are what's called ACA certified, American Correctional Association certified. So the materials that we produce have already been okayed by all of the prisons in America. Fantastic. We're probably one of the largest organizations out there that are able to get materials into prisons. And we are in 4,000 prisons. And what's nice is we've developed relationships with the wardens and they want and need materials. Mm. And they know we have materials that are gonna help their prisoners. So they contact us and they say, do you have any more? We get letters, countless letters, requests from different organizations, different prisons, asking for our materials. And we are there ready to provide it free for the prisoners. 
and they just love it. We're excited that we're getting ready to launch at the Elmore Correctional Facility in Elmore, Alabama. The warden said, I want to be the first one. I want That's my correct. prison to be the first one. And when everybody sees what we're doing, they're going to want this material. Fantastic. So we're and by excited. the way, I will be personally teaching at the prisons, uh, the prison in Elmore, Alabama, with the PREG program to launch it. So, so in uh, your role as a director of UPMI, you, you, this is not an office job. This is a field, <laughs> this is a field job. <laughs> this is it's a, a field, field job. job. Getting good under your fingernails. John, it's something that I'm passionate and love. I like to preach. I like to teach. These are the gifts that God gave me. So now I get a chance to influence a group of men and women that I believe when they're released will have even greater impact for the kingdom of God. Mm. In fact, this guy that I was telling you about, he says, Doc, when you train guys in prison and gals in prison, they become the most loyal soldiers you could ever train. What do you think that is? Because we get them when they're at their lowest. We give them hope. Yes. And the that's hope. the thing that they're needing more than anything. We provide hope to every prisoner. And when they receive the information that we share with them, it liberates them. So we're trying to prepare them for reentry by bringing them hope through the PREP project so that when they do reenter society as returning citizens, they can make it. They don't have to go back to prison. See, one of the things, John, I found in my personal study of the Word of God and then my academic study is that when the gospel is presented correctly, it doesn't just liberate spiritually, it liberates economically. And that's what prisoners need to hear. The number one reason why they're in jail, they're trying to provide for themselves. And so you walk through a process from the Bible, truth from God's word about how to live a productive life in this world, it gets them excited. And when you teach them that, as I said earlier, they become loyal because nobody else took the time to do it. I want to talk about some of the, uh, some more of the success stories that you know of, people you've worked with, people that United Prison Ministries International have assisted over the years. 78 million 78 pieces of million. literature have gone to the prison system. Phenomenal. Countless people ministered to. Thousands of prisons have been impacted by the work of United Prison Ministries International. Let's talk about some individuals, men or women that you know of, whose lives have been turned around, that, that UPMI have ministered to, and, and today you've got to call this person a success story. Well, our star student is a guy that's been in prison for 47 years. 47 years. At 16 years old, he was in prison for a crime that he didn't do, a hideous crime, and he's been behind bars for the 47 years of his life. Mm. I don't even understand that, to be honest. But when he got in, he was so discouraged and so distraught because it was an unjust uh, commitment to prison. Uh, and he didn't know what to do. He was uh, just 16 uh, years old. By the old. way, I've got to insert Go myself ahead. in here. A lot of people have a hard time accepting that there are people behind bars unjustly because, mm -hmm. you know, the vast majority of prisoners that most people have spoken to, I don't deserve to be here. Okay, sure. There are a lot of people in prison facing very, very long sentences. We've, we've spoken them on it, some on it is written. Mm -hmm. Very long prison sentences, wrongfully convicted. That's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. It's, it's hopeless. And see, this guy entered into prison and his whole family abandoned him. Mm -hmm. No one in his family has contacted him in 47 years. Oh, have mercy. And so at the age of 21, United Prison Ministry comes alongside of him. And he sees the founder of it and says, out of kind of a challenge to one of the guys in the prison, he said, I'm going to ask him if he will be my dad. Just out of a kind of a challenge, kind of a yeah. whatever it was. And he went up to him. And he said, I'll be, I'll be your dad. And actually, United Prison Ministry has become his family. If you talk with him today, he will tell you that the only family I have is United Prison Ministries International. Yes, and our COO says, he's my brother. Mm. They consider Andre his brother, his family. And he sees us as his family. His family. We're checking on him and just following him. 
but he did some phenomenal things while he was behind bars. He earned 10 degrees. 10. 10. 10. They have time. We would talk about yeah. how much time they have. They have a lot of time available. Well, he maximized the use of his time. You would think, and I got a chance to meet Andre because I went to the prison. You would think that if you were uh, com committed to life in prison and now without parole mm. for a crime you didn't do, that you would be angry, that yes. you would be bitter. Sure. He has no bitterness. He's preaching. He became He's a, preacher. a preacher. He's a preacher. In, in he fact, is a in preacher. Fact, who was that preacher that he said he, he, he started listening Brooks. to? Brooks. Brooks. C.D. Brooks. Yeah, well, you listen to C.D. Brooks, you're going to get right. straightened out. <laughs> he <laughs> did. can't go wrong. Oh, wow. And he now, when you meet him, he is a phenomenal Christian. He Beautiful. has helped thousands. People who have been released, they give credit to Andre for the success that they have because of the ministry that, he's, that he has behind bars. He actually helps to direct our Friday night ministry that we have at the Elmore Prison. Beautiful. Every Friday night. It's called UPMI Night. Nice. And they come in, and he has done a marvelous job of preaching and teaching and encouraging others while he himself is behind bars. Okay, let me ask you a question. Maybe it's a delicate question. Some of the people you minister to have done very bad things, hurt people maybe killed people, have upended lives, destroyed families, some of the people that you minister to. So I want to give you the answer, uh, opportunity to answer this question. Why fool with them? Why do they deserve resources and assistance and people pouring themselves after what they have done? John, that's an excellent question. And you know, I got into this prison ministry because God drove me into it. I was retired, planning to write books, okay? Not really concerned about going into the prison, but then when God gave me this responsibility, I began doing my own personal research, talking to prisoners, reading books, reading all the information, and my heart was broken. Because when I realized the Bible itself was written for prisoners by prisoners. That is a very fascinating insight. You know, the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, who was a criminal on the run. That's right. He should have been in jail. He was a murderer. Okay. And then Paul, in the New Testament, wrote 14 of those, those letters and gospels, and four of them were written in prison, and they were not the best conditions that he was writing on. Mm -hmm. And so... I began to watch Paul's life through his word and his writing. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3, he says, remember those that are in prison. And I said, God, I've been seeing this for years. Help me understand it. And God says, because that's the condition you were in when I found humanity. Mm. And I don't want you to ever forget it. They are the lost. They're the isolated, they're the forgotten, and that's what this planet was until Jesus came. And so God says, as I did it for you, you need to do it for these men and women behind bars. It's a reminder of what I've done for the world. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, when I look at these prisoners, I see myself, man. If it were not for Christ, I'd be in the same shape. That's right. I think Paul said it, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And many of these men and women who are behind bars didn't have the opportunities that we had. Right. They came up in dysfunctional homes as a pastor on the front line who pastored 33 years, 13, 14 different churches. I saw people whose lives were horrible because of their family of origins, the communities that they lived in, the broken lives. And it's a wonder that more of them aren't behind bars. Mm -hmm. So when I look at them, I said, well, God, thank you for this opportunity to minister to my brothers and, sh and sisters on and from the grace you've given me, I can give to them. Mm -hmm. They are just as redeemable as anybody in society because they're just like us, our brothers and sisters. Pr prison ministry is really f f functions from a, a, a place of compassion. Yes. Dr. Susie Hill, yeah. isn't that right? Yes, it does. And, you know, God does. He shows us when we do that. In as much as we've done it to the least of these, my brethren, yes. we've done it unto Christ. So we want the same thing. We want the Lord to do the same for us. 
So all we're doing is returning that very same love that God has given to us, the grace that he shows us every day in our lives. We are no better. When the first time I went into a prison, I was shocked. It was a worship service. I want you to know, John, that it was like, I, I looked around and I said, wait a minute, are we in church? <laughs> it was the high, it was high. They were singing from the top of their voices. And I looked at those men and they didn't look any different than I looked. And I said, these, and they were men from all various professions. And so I said, wow, there's no difference between me and them. And one of them said, yeah, the only thing that's different between me and you is that we got caught. <laughs> so I said, Lord, we can't look down. We have to be there. We have to be able to serve. We must put ourselves in that position of having a heart and a love for the men and women behind bars. And we don't do it by ourselves, by the way. We have our organization actually partners. We talked about, we talked about the partnership. We partner to make this ministry available, the materials available with other organizations like Amazing Facts, like it is written, <laughs> like uh, Christmas Behind Bars. We help prisoners get materials. They call us for the materials and we're able to distribute it. We can't do it alone. We cannot and we don't do it alone. So we're grateful for the partnerships that we have. That's why we were named United Prison Ministries because we unite with all organizations like yours and others to help minister to our brothers and sisters behind bars. Profoundly important. There's much more I want to ask you. I'm so glad that you've taken this time to join us uh, with Dr. Roland Hill and Dr. Susie Hill. I am John Bradshaw. We'll have more of our conversation in just a moment. One thing that the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us is the importance of maintaining our health. Yes, it's true that some health problems cannot be avoided. Some medical conditions are genetic. Some seem to come out of nowhere. But the vast majority of health issues affecting our world today are lifestyle related. That means there's something we can do about them. But what? Join me for five steps to safeguard your health you'll learn about five simple but important steps that you can take to ensure that you're doing all you can to protect and maintain your health. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Our bodies are a gift from God and we want to take care of them so we can give ourselves the best chance to live long, happy, productive lives serving God. Don't miss five steps to safeguard your health. Brought to you by It Is Written TV. Discover the powerful ways that God is part of the healing process. Go beyond what the media and popular trends say about healthcare and learn from an expert what it really means to be healthy. In his book, The Ultimate Prescription, Dr. James L. Markham explains some of the common misconceptions about healthcare that are prevalent in our society today, how you can avoid them, and how to take care of the spiritual dimension of your health. To order The Ultimate Prescription, call 888-664-5573 or visit itiswritten.shop. Join me on It Is Written TV for great chapters of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's the resurrection chapter, which means the Bible in 1 Corinthians 15 offers us hope. Everybody wants hope. And everybody, if Jesus does not return, is bound to die. But what then? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that death is an enemy, the last enemy that will be destroyed. But the Word of God assures us that there is hope beyond the grave and there is life after life in this world. 1 Corinthians 15, it's one of the great chapters of the Bible. You will be encouraged and you will be blessed as you collide with the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and the resurrection which is to come. Great chapters of the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Don't miss it. Watch now on It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Conversations, where my guests are Dr. Susie Hill and Dr. Roland Hill. They are the directors of United Prison Ministries International, an outstanding organization which for 40 years had ministered to people behind bars and has helped people to successfully transition to a life outside of the, the prison system. Now, you were called to this role not too terribly long ago. It had to be tremendously overwhelming, but you're excited about the future of United Prison Ministries International with good reason. 
Dr. Susie, I'll start with you. Tell me one or two things that you are just plain excited about that UPMI is involved in right now. Well, you know, we're relaunching. I'm so glad to be a part of the ministry. Like I said, God directed us. And then when God is leading you, he opens the door. We're walking through it. We have a powerful team. I have never seen a group of dedicated foot soldiers. They have been carrying the ministry, even during COVID, when a lot of people were not allowed to go into prisons. We were able to continue carrying our materials. Fantastic. And the prisoners received it. It didn't affect us at all. I said, wow, this is a God thing. And so other ministries are asking us to share our materials with them because they can't go in. They're just not even now as we speak. They're closing some of the prisons on the East Coast. Mm. And so we were talking with one of the ministry federations and they said, what are we going to do? I said, well, we can still get into the prisons. We can still send the materials to the prisons on the East Coast. So that's exciting. I'm glad that the gospel can continue to go forward. We carry the gospel where we go, wherever we go. The prisoners are receiving it. And when they request it, it's free to them. So what more can you ask for? So it's exciting to see the team working hard. And we are just looking for great things that God is getting ready to do mm-hmm. through United Prison Ministries. Roland, what a couple of things that are firing you up is you, uh, you, 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 you're sitting at the at the at the uh, the helm of this thing alongside well, your wife. Well, as you could, you can feel my propulsion. I am really excited. I love to teach and preach. And we get a chance to go behind bars and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the three angels message, in a way that I think is unique because I am a pastor and I've had a long history of studying God's word. And so I'm able to bring new and fresh understandings from God's word. In fact, we're scheduling three prison revivals this year. That's correct. That's fantastic. Prison revival. And I'm going to do prophecy for prisoners. And I'm going to do it in a way that will help them see prophecy where they are. And that excites me. I'm excited because I believe This will be an opportunity for people to awaken to see what's really happening behind bars. I've talked to bishops and other denominations. I've talked to a number of our leaders and our faith community, and they really aren't sensitive to what's going on. So I become the voice, and that's what excites me. I become the voice to speak on behalf of 2.2 million brothers and sisters behind jail, behind bars, and 5.2 million that are out here trying to find their way to re-enter society. I love being the voice for those that are the underdogs. So that excites me. A friend of mine, I don't want to overstate that, a fellow I, I, I knew uh, had been in prison, significant sentence. The vast majority of people later on never knew that he was a, uh, became a minister of the gospel. So the potential behind bars is just phenomenal. It strikes me, though, as odd. You spoke about speaking to uh, religious leaders from a wide variety of faiths. They're not really familiar with what's going on behind bars, which is fascinating. I asked you a question earlier. We've been commanded to minister to people behind bars. That's correct. Isn't it an option for the Christian? Mm -mm. It's a command. And and, and Jesus spoke about this. He said, I was in prison and you visited me, you know. And then he contrasted, I was in prison. Y'all did not visit me. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a pretty significant thing there in the way Jesus shared that. So you, you have an opportunity to reach and represent a vast group of people. Speak to me about the receptivity to the gospel that you find behind bars. So I was preaching uh, New Year's Eve. All right. That's just a couple of weeks ago. And in the chapel was about 30 some men. My wife was there with me, okay? And John, I'm gonna tell you, because I'm one of those kind of, I'm a pastor preacher, okay? I feel the hearts of the listeners. Man, these guys were on the edge of their seat. And it's interesting, I wanna throw this in because One of the reasons why I want to be a voice, because most people think that it's only minorities behind bars. Mm -hmm. But 69% of the men and women behind bars are white. 
And so I have a passion for reaching all people. So we're in this chapel and it was largely white men. They were on their feet. They were, and they know the scripture. Yes. That's another thing. They receive the gospel because they have time. They are reading the Bible. They are reading the great controversy that we have sent to them. They're reading these books and they are informed and they're responding, they're responding to it. So when you hear them and see them, you say, man, these men know God. They mm. know God. So when we come and we tell them we're coming in to prepare them with the Prison Economic Reform Educational Program, they're signing up. They're signing up. Because they want to be changed. They want to receive the message that God has for them for salvation. They want to be saved. I do sign language. So I presented a song in sign language entitled Going to Heaven. And I asked them, how many of you want to go to heaven? They all raised their hands. Sure. Amen. They all want to be saved. And so it was wonderful. And then I had them signing with me. They loved it. They just ate it up. They just, they're ready. As a matter of fact, did we tell you that we, Roland and I, have prison fever? <laughs> prison fever. Prison, prison fever. fever. <laughs> all right. Yes. I caught it when I took over this organization. And now the thermometer doesn't even hold my temperature yeah, anymore. Amen. Amen. We're so passionate about it, John. These are brothers and sisters, man. And you, you, you ask about receptivity. Man, these guys are dying for hope. That's the great thing. When you're locked behind bars, your family doesn't talk to you, see you. Some of them have been abandoned. They're looking for an organization. They're looking for people. They're looking for a word that will give them hope. And we get excited about bringing them hope. In fact, Here's one of the things we've decided to do. We're going to teach them mastery. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Glad you asked, I, 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 I love the sound <laughs> of that. Tell me about that. Well, studies have shown in order to master something, you need six to 10 years. And many of these guys, that's what they have. Sure. Okay. Or 10,000 hours. So now they have the time isolated and solitude, uninterrupted time where they can master, I call it SEATS. It's an acronym for the first S is for spirituality, spiritual mastery. The next E or the next letter is E, and that is emotions. They can master their emotions. Yeah, because share with them. Yeah, because many of them are behind bars because they didn't master their That's emotions. Right. They're out of control. That's so right. we are now helping them to take, first of all, responsibility and ownership for their emotions and then learn how to control mm. their emotions and master them. Yeah, that's important. And then mm -hmm. some form of art. That's the A. I mean, art allows you to express yourself in ways that words can't do it. So master either drawing a musical instrument or singing, whatever. And then the T is for a trade. OK, you learn some kind of trade. Many of these guys are going into culinary school, mm -hmm. you know, to learn how to cook and be chefs. Some are becoming carpenters, electricians. So they master trade. And then the last thing is some specific body of knowledge. Just think, John, if you had 20 years to take one specific topic and you master it. So when they leave, as I tell them and as I told them, when you leave, you will be a seven degree black belt. <laughs> In almost anything you want. That's In correct. anything you want, yes. And when you leave, you are able to sit at any seats that are available out there. Beautiful. Because now you're in control and mastery of your life. Yeah, fantastic. That is, that is profound. Now, I'm going to ask you this. 78 million pieces of literature, thousands of prisons, foot soldiers, and none of them. You can't do this on your own. So what does it take to keep an organization like United Prison Ministries International on the front lines? How can people help? That's an excellent question. We have a number of full-time workers that work with us, okay? And we have to pay them. We have to buy material. We have to print material. So you have it to takes buy and print a lot a of material. Lot of material. A lot. In our warehouse right now, we have over a million people's pieces of different literature. That cost us. That sure does. So we need monthly supporters. In fact, in fact, I like we are we're actually launching Pentecostal givers. We need three thousand Pentecostal givers. That's correct. <laughs> where 
you know, we're not asking for a large sums, like $25 a month. That helps because like we said, all the material is free for the prisoners, but it's not free for us. We've got to invest and it takes time. In fact, we have a shipment that's going off next week to Cuba, 180,000 pieces of literature. Mm, mm. And, you know, Cuba was closed for a long time. So long, yeah. But we have, United Prison Ministries International, we have been given an open door to send materials to Cuba. So we've been in touch with the Cuban Union, and they are actually the go-between for us to be able to get the materials into Cuba. But it costs money. And so we need supporters, people who are willing and wanting to be a part of the, mini the prison ministry so that they can help get the gospel out. We need sponsors. This uh, P-Rep project, yeah. it costs $99 to sponsor one of our prison inmates, okay, either in or out. And then, of course, there are people that, major donors, who say, listen, I see what you're trying to do, and we want to give a major contribution we will tell you, we will make sure that your investment is well taken care of because the vision for United Prison Ministry is huge. You know, our goal with the pre-rep project is 330,000 prisoners and ex-offenders trained over the next five years. I that said it right. Be, it, that would be fantastic. And, and be by fantastic. the way, it's not difficult to do because we're in 4,000 prisons. Yeah. So that's less than 100 prisoners per uh, prison. Yeah. Over the next five years. Over, Over the, the next, next five, five years. years. That's Boy, a that, doable. That's, I was about to use that exact word. That's very doable. Mm -hmm. See, I'm thinking about this. I, I, I'm thinking of United Prison Ministries International without financial support. What happens is the whole thing dries up because yes. uh, now, now we're not going to minimize the importance of prayer support. Yeah, and God. We need right. that. No, no question about it. But uh, literature doesn't print itself. Paper doesn't pay for itself. Uh, uh, the, the time, the effort, the organization, the collaboration, r running the ministry doesn't pay for itself. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just imagining a world without UPMI. Well, I can tell you what prisoners say through their letters. Go ahead. They thank us every day. We get dozens of letters in for prisoners who are saying, if it had not been for United Prison Ministry and the literature that we get behind bars, we would be hopeless we would not have any desire to do better. But your literature helps to transform our hearts and minds. And even, even when they return to society, we have currently, like we were talking about Daniel, his family, they're not, he cannot leave the state. His prison sentence locks him into the state of Alabama. He cannot leave. And his family members, you know, they would like to take him in, but they can't. So this is what they're saying to us. Thank you because we house them. Thank you for making sure that he's gonna be on his feet. Thank you for providing the opportunity for him to get a job. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for us and God has blessed us. So we can't do it alone. So we do partnerships with other organizations and God is blessing. So we do ask for people to come, come alongside. If you can't go into the prison, you can certainly give and donate and allow the message to go forward. I will say this too. While we distribute literature into prisons, we also give toiletries. Ah. Yes. You know, many prisons, prisons don't provide these guys toothpaste and toilet paper and things like this. They have to purchase that. Family members have to give it. And if they give some toiletries, it's very limited. You know, so during the Christmas holiday, United Prison Ministry gave 700 and 20 tubes of to toothpaste. Regular size, because the prison provides a little, you've been to the hotels, right? Yeah, yeah. Whenever you leave, the little small tube, yeah. how many times can you use that? That ain't good for much. That's what they gave them. So when they got a regular size tube of toothpaste, it was like $100 and for That was them. true Christmas for them. That was Christmas. They, that was better than anything. And they said, thank you so much. So we were blessed to be able to get toothpaste for the prisoners, that was their Christmas present from us. So you are making a difference in, I think, more ways than, than, yes. than people can imagine. L looking into the future, I have to believe that the future for United Prison Ministries International is bright. And what that means is a bright future and bright hope for countless men and women who today are behind bars, Lord willing, tomorrow they may not be, mm -hmm. become productive members of society, 
leaning on Jesus, demonstrating what the power of the gospel can do in a person's life. Let me ask you both. We just have a, a short time left. Let, let, let's just transition ever so slightly and talk about, because I think this under, undergirds United Prison Ministries International. Talk about the power of the gospel. We don't have long. I'll give you about a minute each. Speak to me, Dr. Dr. Susie Hill, about the power of the gospel, as perhaps you've experienced it, seen it in the Bible, or seen it in the life of somebody else. Well, I can tell you from the very beginning, from, I gave my heart to Jesus when I was 10. I was baptized the year that I turned 11, but I was still 10 years old. And I remember when I was baptized, I remember feeling the Spirit of God moving in my life at that young age. And I stayed committed to Christ. And I loved the Lord. And I, my home church grounded me. I was involved in the church and it helped to make a difference. I went to a Christian school and then went to college and met my husband in college. But I've also seen, when I met my husband, I didn't have the faith. He would say, we're going to be doing this. And I said, oh, no, I don't know about that. But I've grown in my own faith. Now, when God is telling us to do something, I believe him. I believe him, and I'm able to share that faith. So it has been a wonderful walk with him. I've enjoyed knowing the Lord. I, I count it a privilege because there are some who don't know Jesus. That's right. So I count myself privileged to know the Lord as my Savior and to follow in his truth, to be in this wonderful message, to, to know about how, to, uh, you know, how, how I can make my life what he has in intended for it to be. And when I think about those who don't know Jesus, it's so wonderful because I've actually helped others come to know the same Jesus that mm -hmm. I know. That is the most rewarding experience to see somebody go through a, 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 an evangelistic crusade who didn't know Christ, receive the message, and then be baptized. Amen. That's right. The gospel transformed my own life. And as a pastor, I preached the gospel and I baptized literally hundreds whose lives have been changed because of the gospel preached from the Word of God. I'm convicted that it is the power of God to salvation. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Tell me what you see. You've got a few seconds. Looking, looking forward, what, what's exciting you about United Prison Ministries International, what God is doing? We're developing major materials that will transform how prisoners think behind bars. That's exciting. I'm a writer. I love to write. And God has blessed me with the gift and I have a number of projects. We have a number of projects that will be going out into the prisons all over the world from the writings that God has given us. We're excited about that. I wish you God's blessing. We all do. Dr. Susie Hill, Dr. Roland Hill from United Prison Ministries International. Thank you. This has been a blessing. God bless you both. Thank you. Appreciate you joining us. He is Dr. Roland Hill. She is Dr. Susie Hill. And this has been our conversation.